So this is What's Your Story? And believe it or not, there's actually a fascinating story that lives within your data. And today we're gonna to show you a few great techniques to design clear, informative dashboards that help communicate that story to your audience. So here with us today is Beth Rounds, Dapperc's Chief Marketing Officer, and John Bird, our Senior Vice President. Together, they have tons of experience in the market research industry. And after working at Dapperc, they're experts in dashboard design. And so Great. John Bird's gonna start us off today. Thank you very much, Jessica. And just to set the stage, um, we are Dapperc. Dapperc is a global provider of visual data reporting software. And we are very focused on the market research data and all the fun we have to deal with with market research data. We're distributing dashboards to over, we've distributed 14, over 14,000 dashboards globally. We have as to over 1,700 enterprises and we have a global presence with eight offices and 60 employees. <laughs> We're very fortunate to have year over year growth of 30% as well. So Toby Anderson, our founder and uh, the CEO of Dapperc, kind of perfectly sets the stage. When so on the agenda, we're going to talk a little bit about the evolution of insights. I'm going to follow that up with some back to basics and uh, some uh, design best practices. And, and we will have several examples to show you on how to visualize your data to tell a better story with infographics. So in the beginning, I think many of us could probably raise our hands right now and say that you stood behind the Xerox machine and created 300 page decks and then took those decks into the conference room and loaded binders. And these decks were comprised primarily of PowerPoint slides. And this truly was, you know, the technology of the day to get data and information out to the field. And then eventually we started coding uh, dashboards. Um, they were fun at the time. They were very, very time consuming. They could take months to produce, which was not acceptable in the days, in today's uh, market research world. And then eventually we started delivering insights and combining multiple sources of market research data to kind of get a good picture of what's going on with the brand to where we are today, which is des designing and delivering intelligence where we can show a picture to put it in context, but also deliver it on a device that's appropriate for the person consuming the data. But we still need to tell an engaging story and add context. In this example, half of you can probably realize that this is talking about Brexit, you know, by combining the UK and the EU flags, we really start to tell a story. You understand what's gonna happen. You're understanding what's going on with the data before you really start to dig into it. Another quick example is pulling together multiple market resource, resource data sources just to tell a broader picture of what's going on with this specific brand. And the reality at the end of the day, PowerPoint just doesn't cut it anymore. I mean. I've spent many years loading binders and setting up PowerPoint decks, and it's just not a lot of fun. And that's not how our clients truly want to receive their primary data. And the reality is we're a very mobile population, and we need to consume data across multiple platforms. If you're a chief executive, you know, you're going to want to view it on your desktop, possibly, or maybe on your phone on the way into the office. If you're running a McDonald's, you want to be able to see it on your mobile phone while you're act actually at the location. So the needs to get the data out is very important. So the question is, John, where do you start, right? It's um, easy to say, it's harder to do. I think one of the things that I think about is rule number one is no more kitchen sink projects. For those of you who are in the research and design area of the business, you may know or understand this phrase. Too often we start with great intentions when we're designing a study. You may have two to three key objectives, you start designing the survey, and then a committee gets involved. And next thing you know, you've been asked to add a new section to the study, it's only 10 more questions, and so the story goes it becomes unwieldy um, and the study takes on a life of its own. Now, I'm not saying that's every study that's out there. It's much easier probably to do a concept test or some copy testing. But when you start thinking about 
larger, more strategic studies, um, it becomes a problem. And so these studies take a life of its own and it becomes a bit unwieldy and unfocused. Our, our sample and data collection colleagues will definitely chime in and say uh, no kitchen sink studies and the fact that the larger the study and the more unfocused it is, you're risking respondent fatigue, abandonment, and certainly data quality issues. Um, and then when it comes down to reporting, which we're in the business of, it also becomes an issue because you're really having trouble finding the story in all of this data. That's what a kitchen sink study is. And I say, rule number one, no more. So what does that mean? Uh, you know, if you're going to be a great storyteller, the challenge for you and your organization is really to get back to those basics. I know this sounds simple, simple and when I talk to uh, re research professionals on both sides, whether you're at an agency or you're in a corporate account, in those folks are who are doing storytelling, who really are understanding and grasping the concept of that, are really courageous and I would say taking taking um, a leap into being more disciplined. I talked to a woman last week who runs a, a research organization within a, within a corporation up in Canada uh, and she was saying that she's really um, sold the idea into the organization to do smaller studies, more focused and really uh, surrounded around the definition of what are the true objectives we're trying to accomplish. And in our experience, we find that dashboard and reporting forces this conversation and change in behavior. So you need to start clearly with defining the objectives, not more than two or three. Certainly, we'll show an example coming up uh, in the next couple of slides on a brand tracking study. And the goal is really to focus on brand awareness and how you're doing against competition. The objective really is to assess where, where, how you're doing on your marketing strategy among your tar target groups. The next thing is it really aligns well then with trying to identify what your key metrics are, your KPIs. And we know that because um, those, those key metrics are really the most important things, especially to the CMO in the organization, your marketing director. If you're in the customer experience area, you know that those KPIs are around NPS and certain certainly touch points. Know that who your audience is. We, we know that is really important. We're gonna share a little bit more about that later on in the, in the presentation. Those that are really good storytellers are building their report up front. They're building their storyboard of hypotheses as they're designing the survey. Again, this woman I talked to uh, last week was saying that she's really combining the ability to really design the survey and the report all in one. Now, that doesn't mean that you're inserting the data into that, but there is a storyboard that that you are actually building and um, you're using the data to support the story rather than the other way around. Good storytelling starts with an outline. So building that report up front, whether it's a dashboard or you're using an alternative format, uh, not only saves time overall in delivery, that's the benefit to you, it's also less stressful in the long run. So let's show you an example here. When we talked about key metrics and, and objectives, the, John showed this example briefly before and I'm gonna ask him to weigh in on this one. You can see that just in this one dashboard, we have all the key things that certainly a CMO, a C-suite, and even areas within the marketing group are interested in. You've, you've got the brand awareness, of course, aided unaided, which is very typical in that type of a study. We've also, though, you can see we've got competition. You've got some benchmarks in there. You've got some arrows of directional, how you're doing up and down. You've also got uh, awareness by channel. Very easy to visually um, show, both in a graphical format, but also, again, with indicators. Again, you can look very quickly to see how you're doing in that. And then, of course, attributes are really important in a brand tracker. 
And we've got that also here. Very easy. John, I, I would like you to talk about that funnel because I think that's a very interesting kind of infographic way of sharing information. Yeah, I love, um, I mean, there's a lot about this dashboard I like. I mean, one, it is, it contains a lot of information, which some dashboards try to avoid, but, uh, you know, this is pulling in multiple sources of data, of market research data. I mean, conceptually, you could be a marketing manager and want to see what's going on with sales. So how how are my customers looking at my business? What's my net promoter score? So in addition to, you know, my awareness, consideration, preference of my brand, what's going on with my customer's overall satisfaction. You know, in that brand funnel really starts to talk a bit about that. You know, I love the conditional formatting. It allows you to, you know, be more engaged with the data, help put the data more in, in context, but most importantly, make it actionable. So I can look at this chart and quickly scan and start to see immediately, you know, I've got a down arrow here. There's something going on with my aided awareness. I've got some problems over here with my ad awareness by channel in the cinema in the cinema category, who knows how big that is, but you know, it, it's making it very actionable. And so instead of it just being a raw number on a piece of paper that is nice to know, I can immediately follow up with, maybe there's a marketing manager that's responsible for the cinema program and I can follow up with him and see you know, what's going on with um, awareness in that channel. So to me, that's a perfect example. This example of in the past, you would have all of these PowerPoint slides, right? So here we've incorporated so much information in one way. And you can see also the fact that you can drill into details. It's not like this is the only thing that people can look at. You can look at by country. This happens to be Germany. But also we can dive into details for those that are interested. But this gives one snapshot that's telling, again, telling the story because we've defined the key the objectives and the key metrics appropriately. We talked a lot about uh, knowing your audience, and I think this is one thing. I, about three years ago, I was running a small company with a group of people down in Atlanta, and um, I remember one client specifically, a lot of um, uh, a very huge tracking program and different areas of the company by function were interested in different pieces of the data. So we had one big deck, it ended up being PowerPoint, one big deck, and then we had to make changes or modifications to the data and that deck and the story to all different levels. And I know that that is um, painstakingly um, difficult. You've got potential for quality issues and others, but I think that the important thing is you need to really understand who your audience is. Again, we are a dashboard company, so we are going to be talking more about how you can think about this more. But Whatever format you're doing, you have to really think about a CEO, C-level is going to be carrying, like we showed before, key metrics. Those that are more analysts and geeky, you know, they're going to really want to get into deeper dives, which is I want to know more details about my region or my area, like John was talking about, my marketing programs that I'm in. And then if you're out, especially you think about customer experience work, where team um, and regional managers are really wanting to get into say touch point information how am i doing and how am i doing against other regions because they're usually in some sort of competition together um, and so you really need to think differently about the information needs across those different groups who your audience is and what are they really looking for I love this example because this really, um, the next two slides are really going to show you something that we also talk about, which is uh, bringing the information to life, both in, in, in context for the person. This is a great example of um, a, a housekeeping um, study. So it's uh, obviously hotel, hospitality, and the, the participants or customers are rating um, how they how they felt about the room, right? Was it clean? Uh, the, did they like the pillows? How was the bathroom? You know, again, that's cleanliness is a huge thing there. And then, you know, room overall, um, did it look shabby? Did they vacuum? Did they, uh, were they attention to detail? You know, you can look at this and say, well, I'm probably doing okay on the bathroom overall. I got some problems. Boy, I got to go look and see. Oh, the wastebasket. I've got I've got some issues. I wonder what's going on there. So yeah, I can look at it and I can study it, but 
let's show you the next example where it really is telling a story to that housekeeper. So that young woman can go in and she can really look very quickly in a very different way, can really look because we've put the data into where those elements are or those attributes that the participant rated them on. So you can immediately see that we've got some problems going with the wash basin and that wastebasket. Yeah, I found it in the other data, but it was much easier for me to see not only am I doing really well on certain things, but I'm really falling short and I really need to go in and look at that data. So another way for people to not only experience it, but it's very memorable. And I think that's what visualization and telling a story is all about. And it's kind of gets back to the old adage, time is money. I mean, housekeepers don't have a whole lot of time to do their day job. So being able to see how they're performing very quickly, I think helps everybody involved from the consumer of the data to the manager of this person. So I think it's all very, very important. So how do we design reporting to inspire and, and even engage the end user? I mean, I think, you know, this is literally an example I had in my days in the it, it, TNS, but it's not inspiring and engaging, but you know we've all done it this way for many, many years. I, you know, you want access, you have your KPIs, trust, loyalty, equality, equity. On the top, you have your key filters, you know, so your demographics, maybe some regions. And in my life, I would take this, I'd print it out, I'd grab my ruler and I'd run across the trust axis and see how I was doing by different genders. And that's and that was the way I did it. But wouldn't this be a much better way of, de of delivering that exact data? So I have my core KPIs, trust, loyalty, et cetera. And I also have all my key um, filter variables up above so I can digest the data based on what I want to see. So I want to look at Boston. I want to look at a specific age and gender group. And I want to look at a specific income level. Much easier way in this scenario to digest the data. Another kind of classic is uh, our, our history of building these fabulous attribute-based uh, bar charts. I mean, we would uh, build these, you'd slap your logo in the bottom left-hand corner and then move on to the next page. How about telling a better story and putting it into the business process? In this example, we've all traveled for a terminal. Um, you can see kind of clockwise the experience in the boarding process, the waiting lounge, the shops. And as I go around, I'm going to start to see what I'm going to introduce as conditional formatting. So I'm seeing a frowning face. So early education teaches us there's something going on here with passport control. So intuitively in my head, I want to click on that icon and drill down one more layer into what's going on. And I'll start to see clarity on what's going on in passport control. No big surprise. Um, waiting times and queues are still a huge issue at passport control, but they continue to be an issue. And if I kind of scroll over, I can start to see what's going on with the number of counters that may have been opened or closed, and even drill down into some of the open-end comments so I can see what are these people saying about passport control to really get a better understanding of that business. Again, nice conditional formatting that's tied directly to the data, so there's no need or no concern about, did I copy that icon from Excel into PowerPoint correctly? It really takes care of everything for you. This next exam example, we're looking at the game day experience and all the touch points from the arrival at the stadium to uh, the departure and the uh, associated performance on each of those different areas. Again, putting it into context, making it very intuitive. And this is probably very en engaging for the person running the stadium. You know, they know what's going on and they can act on the information if it's, if it's trending in the wrong direction or not against their plan. Here's an example for a banking, uh, for a bank. So I've got, again, conditional formatting. I've got the thumbs up. If, if the trends were down, that could flip to a thumbs down. I've got my overall satisfaction rating here and how I'm trending overall. I've got the ability to calculate best in class with the green line and the worst in class with that yellow line. And hey, why don't we throw in our targets so we know how we're performing versus something unrelated to the survey data. So maybe you're pulling that in from an Excel file. And then drilling down a little bit further into the different areas of the bank. Again, some nice conditional formatting. This is kind of leveraging kind of a, you know, green is good, red is bad, and, and the yellow is kind of in between and how you're performing versus your plan. 
So just a nice way of visualizing this data. A little more on the whimsical and fun side, but just to give you an example of how design can uh, can take over. Uh, I've got a hotel and my in the center, I have the overall satisfaction of 82%. Again, conditional formatting showing the trends are down. And then if I look counterclockwise, I can start to see you know the performance across all the different areas. And then all these areas you could click on and drill deeper into you know what's going on in the restaurant. Maybe behind the restaurant is a big table with 25 different attributes and I can see what's truly driving that dissatisfaction in the restaurant. But there's also the ability to drill in on the tabs, which is a, a nice feature. And I'm starting to introduce something called um, dynamic tables. There's also some ability to really drill down into the data. So bringing this all to life with a real brand, um, Pete's is not a client. I repeat, Pete's is not a client. Um, this is not their data, but if we were to design a, design a dashboard for them, this is probably what it would look like. You see quickly, you know, kind of an overall customer care score. Maybe that's a combination score of a bunch of different attributes. And it's, you know, it's a 29 and that's actually down versus the prior period or the prior year. So I can quickly start to see Looks like I've kind of got a problem with speed of service and maybe drill down further into that. What I love about this is if you're working at Pete's, it's intuitive, it's engaging, it's putting the data into context, and it's actionable. I can go, you know, when the next time I'm in a store, I can say, hey, we seem to be having a problem with speed to service. You even have the obvious functionality of the filters, so I could actually drill down to the individual store level to see what's going on. And I would say, John, this one is especially designed well for tablets, right? It would it would fit very nicely for store managers to be able to see it in different formats rather than sitting at a desktop. Right. And yeah. if you look at retail, I mean, some of our retailer clients, like, you know, 80% of the data is consumed in the field and it's typically consumed on a smartphone. So in this scenario, instead of it being a landscape picture, it typically you have the different elements scrolling down the page so you can look and see exactly what's going on. One more client that's not a client. Um, again, Apple is not a client and this is not their data, but you can look at this and you can see this is Apple. This is that same example from before, but I see my overall satisfaction. I see the trends and what's going on. I see how I'm performing in my stores versus start to get a good understanding of what's going on in the different areas at the Apple store from the red zone all the way through to the Apple watch try on area. And again, you know, these vertical lines are showing how they're performing versus their goals. Maybe you pull in some of the, you know, top dissatisfiers. And we're also starting to introduce another concept we have, which is closed loop, which is, you know, if there's a complaint or an issue, where are they coming from? Are those alerts being followed up with? And, uh, you know, how successful have they been managed to close? So, a picture is all wonderful. As I say, a picture is worth a thousand words, but you know, all dashboards really need more. I mean, you could probably report on 80% of the information in a, in a nice graphical dashboard with images and tables, but the reality is there's gonna be the time when someone asks the question, I need to know about female mountain bikers in Boulder, Colorado that buy my product and I need to drill into that. And you know, a traditional dashboard doesn't enable that, but with table tools, which are part of the Dapracy platform, you can drill deeper into the data. And there's also an open-end tool. So if you have open-end comments, you can sort and filter what's going on with the data. Just to kind of confirm, there really is, you know, it's nice to have all these pictures and I get a lot of comments on it's great, that's fun, that's interesting, but how do you know how do I deal with the questions that come up on a regular basis? And the you know, table tools, whether you give access to you know, every single person in a company or you restrict it to maybe an analyst in the CFO, maybe she just gets access to a, a, a dashboard. It's really up to you. So I think that uh, we've given you some really great examples. I think that in summary, when we think about this, and this is, so we got a couple more slides past this summary, so stay with us. Um, create visuals that fit your business process and corporate cu culture. We showed you a lot of examples and we're not ones to say that everything has to be infographic, but there's ways that you can can really like that brand tracking where we were incorporating some graphics and other things that really told the story and supported the story versus doing a bunch of cool graphics just for the sake of it. I think that's really important and it really needs to fit your corporate culture. If if the corporate culture of your client or you are a client is much more around more of a graphical approach, then you should use that. If 
people are willing like the Pete's example to really take that and make that for the field to live and breathe the information then that's the way to do it but that's really uh, um, just like if you were to build a website you really want to align it to your brand and make sure that it fits so that people are going to be engaged in it uh, in in the in the data because it really comes down to it's about the information and insights it's not about the cool pictures um, we would also say is keep it simple just like I said visuals need to be intuitive and engaging and not for cool sake um, there are a lot of ways to show cause and effect relationships or create that funnel graphic like we show it really does um, stir and inspire conversation and you can see the cause and effect relationships we've got a lot of examples uh, with that you know use icons as I say um, to support your theme but don't go overboard uh, we've seen some that way too much and um, people get focused on the icons and not a, not the insight and lastly uh, dynamic icons, as, as John was talking about, those are really impactful in being able to have people quickly see what action needs to be taken and use that color coordination to indicate good and bad results. The next thing that people, and I've got a couple slides just uh, for this, is that pointers for thinking about different devices. We know that in the data collection industry, a lot of the, the leaders out there are really talking about how to, how to create questionnaires, right, for, um, and surveys for especially mobile or tablet. And the same rules apply. Um, and we've got, a, you know, five points for you to think about. Same thing, the smaller the device, the shorter the story, which, which means that you've got to, really focus on those key metrics and KPIs and not go overboard. That Pete's example is, again, is a really great um, example of something that could, could fit certainly on a tablet. Um, you need to stay on topic. Make sure the users see the whole picture versus kind of scrolling up and down. You know, how does it fit? So the metrics need to kind of fit in the same place so that they can see those cause and effects well. Um, reduce the number of filters. It, it gets too, you may have a small, more slimmed down version for mobile. Um, that would be our recommendation um, so that it's not uh, too confusing for mobile users and, and uh, they're not going to spend that much time going into filters. They'd need to go back to their, their uh, desktop to do that. Um, use simple visualizations, limit those images. It, it also minimizes the download speed and you have to just think about that. Um, it's important to be visual but not too much and then really think about the implications of touch screen um, it needs to be touch screen ready so those are just some simple simple ideas and things that you should be thinking about when you're constructing a report that you're believing should should be mobile ready so in conclusion I think that we um, hopefully that you have picked up a few ideas John and I want to really thank you for joining us um, we we believe that some of the things that we shared with you can help you increase the value of your visual storytelling, uh, whether you're doing it in an interactive format or if you're using uh, a static format. We think that these, these principles hold true. Um, make sure you're defining those objectives and you're designing your research report up front. Those are so critical. Use the data to support your story. And use visuals to bring that data to life with the experience. But just, just don't go overboard. That's all we say. Have fun and good luck. So next up is that we're willing to be here for you to answer any questions that you might have from the audience. We've got another good 15 minutes. So if anyone has a question for John and me, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. All right, absolutely. We actually have a few questions coming in. And if anybody would like to, to ask, there is a questions chat box that you'll see on the, the right side of your screen. So just enter the questions there and I'll field those to, to John and Beth. And the first few questions that we have are specifically about the Dapercy Pro platform. Um, first question is, are the dashboards real time or are they near time? Good question, and I would have to say <clears throat> near time. I think the, the quickest we can get is 15 minutes, which I think is pretty darn close to real time. Um, a lot of that 
might be driven by need to do some more complex weighting on your side or some DP. But you know, for customer SAP programs, we can get it down to within 15 minutes. Okay. Um, and can the platform be customized to tell a good story based on qualitative information versus quant? And if not, do you have any suggestions or are you aware of any other platform that handles qualitative better? Yeah, we, I mean, we're, uh, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious we're a great fit for quant. Um, where qual has a nice fit is to tell an overlaying story. So maybe you're looking at the satisfaction you know, of your products or the performance of your brand, and maybe you have an, an incremental tab that talks about findings from, you know, maybe it's a, a, a qual based segmentation study. I mean, it, you can embed that data into the dashboard. Um, it becomes a little less interactive because it's going to be relatively static, but um, we have done uh, online reporting with qualitative dynamically, and we've also done it where it's statically just kind of placed on the dashboard. Hope that answers your question. Be happy to show somebody more examples if they have specific questions on that. Okay. Another question is, how are you thinking about leveraging artificial intelligence? <laughs> ah, good question. <laughs> well, I mean, it really depends on how you're defining AI. Um, a lot of what we're already doing is based on alerts. And I showed you that Apple example had some alerts, but I mean, conceptually, you know, if someone comes into the store and they're unhappy at the Genius Bar and they take that survey when it, they leave the store, you know, that could send the alert to um, that store manager and they could, you know, immediately follow up with that person. Um, we've also had discussions about predictive and prescriptive analytics to, you know, understanding what the satisfaction is at a specific store. You know, what is it going to look like in the future, right? Predictive. And then prescriptive, how do we make changes to the satisfaction levels or dials, if you will, to make future satisfaction better. So those are the, some of the areas we're talking about right now. Beth, did you have anything to add? I don't think so. I think that was a good answer. Okay. Um, do you typically use PowerPoint for these dynamic presentations or what other programs work well for dynamic storytelling and presenting? Ooh. I, I I guess if I understand the question is, are we still using PowerPoint to present at conferences or webinars? I think that uh, for the most part, yes, we are. I think that because PowerPoint is a great presentation software, I've experimented with Prezi in the past. Um, boy, is that hard to get your story straight and it can make the audience dizzy when they look at Prezi. So I, 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 I've not had a good experience with that. Um, we do certainly have um, at many times go in and do deep dives into our platform. I think that in thought leadership type work, we're still really trying to relay or, or convey concepts and ideas for people to get them to start thinking about different ways of reporting. So. Uh, answer the question is um, we're still if if the question is for you are we using PowerPoint for our presentations meaning marketing and sales for the most part yes plus demos obviously for reporting for our clients it's all interactive dashboards and I also think there's a need to consume data data differently I mean there's always mm -hmm. going to be to stand up in front of the big audience and present your findings with the overhead projector and you know this is boom 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 all my bullet points but more and more as the generations evolve it's it's you know it's there's a need to consume the in information when it's available so you know if you're running a coffee shop getting that information like when you're in the field it's you know in the olden days you probably had presentations about here here are my hundred coffee shops and here they're all you know in total how they're doing and here are the ones that are bad and here are the ones that are good where today's you know, consumer of the data needs to see that at their store so they can fix the speed of the service right. right then and there. So it's much more actionable. We, you know, we've all sat in the one hour presentations and, you know, just kind of like your mind just kind of, you know, melts and it's almost impossible to act on that data. Where if the data is shifted to your mobile phone and you're consuming it when you need it, it's much more actionable and there's, you know, arguably a much better ROI. I was going to say one more thing, John, is that, um, in another project that you could go to our website and, and see something on uh, is your data is your data c-suite ready in that study that i did of talking to a number of, of organizations um corporations are starting to incorporate video snippets 
into their reporting to especially to c-suite again it's that whole concept of experiencing uh, the data the consumer in ways to prove a point so i've seen video being used much more um, especially for the for the c-suite okay one more um, question we've got a few more questions yeah okay so a lot of dashboards will have a couple different layers or slides so how often are clients looking to go beyond the dashboard and open up the tables that are behind the visualized data? If I understand the question, I mean, typically, typical dashboard design, you'll have like a main landing page that might have all your KPIs. You have, I mean, this could be your landing page. It gives you overall scores of what's going on, all your key attributes. And the, the natural, intuitive way of of navigating this would either be through navigation tabs up above or just to simply click on you know speed of service and behind that i might have a table with all the attributes around speed and be able to drill into that more but then you also really do need the ability to have a, some sort of a table tool that allows you to drill even further into that and yes you can take this information that's in this example and download this information into an excel sheet i mean it's kind of boring when you drop it down into excel but it's it's definitely possible it's literally just an export into into excel but a lot of times what we're finding is you'll have your main page and you have all your supporting pages behind it that kind of get more into the detail and probably report on say 80 percent of what's there and then use the table tool to, to truly drill into the information or into the story Okay, and what applications can you import data from for Dapracy? Uh, it's right now on the market research side. It's you know pretty much if you can create an SPSS file, you can get the data directly into Dapracy. And the beauty of Dapracy is we're literally built for market research data, so you don't have to worry about you know pre-aggregating all your data. Um, we just take a raw SPSS file. So anything that can kick out an SPSS file, we can support. We also have APIs to several survey platforms directly. Okay. Um, any best practices for how often the dashboard should be changed or updated? This attendee is asking for an internal dashboard that's used by marketing leads and business leaders. Well, the biggest mistake I've seen is when you spend someone spends months trying to design a dashboard that's going to be perfect and answer every question. I think what's best is you know good old fashioned keep it simple, and I'll drop the last S. But I mean really keep it simple and start to visualize the data and get it out to the masses so that they can start to see what's going on. And the beauty with our product, not to get too much into that, but is it's you can evolve. So as you know, as you add maybe store measures or different ways of looking at the data, you can simply just add it on as a, a new page or you know slide all these donut charts together and add two more donut charts. I mean, it's literally that easy, just like you would do it in PowerPoint and then connect that directly to the data. So I guess my answer is, start with a clear picture and evolve it over time. And if you think of, of classic tracking studies, I mean, you know, you spend so much time designing the reporting, it's in field, after three years, you're so tired of it. You know, you fire your vendor and you move on to somebody else. I mean, that's just reality. I think with tools like this, you can really evolve the product, make it really intuitive, continue to improve it and make it more engaging, continue to add context so it's relevant to folks, and most importantly, make it actionable. So at the end of year three and you know finance is looking at that one big line of a million dollars on their P&L, they don't just like run, run a red line through it because you truly are getting a nice ROI from it. All right. Thank you so much, John and Beth, for answering these great questions and for giving us this wonderful presentation. Um, that's all the time we have today for questions, but we will be sending out a recording of this webinar to all registrants, and it's going to be available on our website as well. We'll also be sending you a wonderful PDF that's got a couple more um, tips and tricks on how to, to think about designing your own dashboards. So if you want to reach out to either John Bird or Beth Rounds, feel free to email them um, right here, bethadapsy.com and birdadapsy.com to ask any other questions or to speak about, um, about anything else. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time. I hope you all have a great day.